I thought that you've only got three spots. Is that right? Hi, um, yes, uh, good to be back. Um, yeah, I suppose the question uh, I'd just like us to bear in mind is uh, asking, is it possible to be an effective altruist or us to be collectively effective altruists uh, and not address the genetic biological roots of suffering uh, and all that that entails. Um, and uh, so, yes, I'm going to, yes, just a, a short talk and then I hope we can uh, open it up uh, for discussion. Um, May all that hath life be delivered from suffering, said Gautama Buddha. Ab abolitionist bioethics isn't new. What's changed is the technology to make it feasible. Until the biotech revolution, talk of ending suffering belonged to the realm of religious prophets and utopian dreamers. Natural selection didn't design living organisms to be happy. Discontent evolved because it's been hugely genetically adaptive. Human biology means that socioeconomic reform and material abundance can't cheat the negative feedback mechanisms of the hedonic treadmill. Practicing the Noble Eightfold Path won't recalibrate hedonic set points or dismantle the cruelties of the food chain. By contrast, editing our genetic source code can potentially phase out the biology of suffering throughout the living world. Future life can be animated by information-sensitive gradients of well-being, a motivational architecture of gradients of intelligent bliss. Such scenarios for the future of the biosphere are clearly speculative, but what's in question is their sociological credibility, not technical feasibility. My own values are secular and utilitarian. It is not necessary to endorse secularism or utilitarian ethics to recognize that minimizing suffering and promoting happiness is important even if promoting subjective well-being is only one of your values amongst others. The reason for laying such stress on a strategy of genetic biological intervention rather than the older environmental approaches is comparative long-term efficacy. Socio-political reforms, economic growth and personal self-help are important, but they aren't going to abolish the metabolic pathways of suffering. Six months after a quadriplegia-inducing accident or a mammoth lottery win, scientific studies suggest that most people would have reverted to their self-reported level of subjective well-being or ill-being before the accident or jackpot. Unless we tackle the genetic basis of suffering, the evolutionarily ancient cycle of misery and malaise will persist indefinitely. Or as Thoreau puts it, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. Um, OK, what is the hedonistic imperative? Um, the hedonistic imperative advocates the use of biotechnology to phase out the biology of involuntary suffering, not just in humans, but throughout the living world. Future life can be animated by gradients of intelligent well-being, orders of magnitude richer than today's peak experiences. H.I. predicts that the world's last unpleasant experience in our forward light cone, perhaps some minor pain in some obscure marine invertebrate, will be a precisely datable event, perhaps several centuries hence. Um, these are uh, uh, bold claims. Um, here's a simple thought experiment to illustrate why H.I. isn't quite as incredible as it sounds. Um, consider your hedonic range. Schematically, let's order your pleasant and unpleasant experiences on a scale of minus 10 to 0 to plus 10, with minus 10 representing suicidal despair. Hedonic zero is emotionally neutral experience, and plus 10 is a sense of indescribable joy. On this crude scale, chronic depressives are trapped deep in hedonically sub-zero states. Hypothymic people spend most of their lives well above hedonic zero, and bipolars, or manic depressives as they used to be known, oscillate violently between extremes. The rest of us fluctuate around a hedonic set point, either a little above or a little below hedonic zero. Critically, twin studies and recent break breakthroughs in molecular genetics confirm that hedonic set points have a high degree of genetic loading. With this scale in mind, imagine that you can choose 
both for yourself via personal genome editing and your future children via pre-implantation genetic screening or germline editing, the genetic dial settings at the upper and lower bounds of your hedonic range, and also the genetic dial settings for the hedonic range of your prospective children. Imagine, too, that you can choose your average lifelong hedonic set point and your future children's average lifelong hedonic set point, i.e. the approximate default level of ill-being or well-being around which you fluctuate in the course of your life in the absence of short-lived peaks or troughs triggered by triumph or tragedy. Which dial settings for, for hedonic range and hedonic set point would you choose and why? Informal straw polling of prospective parents suggests an, an average favoured default setting of plus 8 or plus 9, with a perhaps surprising number of uh, plus 10 responses. Whatever the exact figure, next consider the nature of selection pressure in a post-Darwinian world where millions and eventually billions of people make similar genetic decisions in anticipation of the likely psychological and behavioural effects of such genetic choices. Recall that traditional natural selection is blind and genetic mutations are random with respect to the direction of evolution. In the coming era of designer babies, the old regime of natural selection will increasingly be replaced by artificial selection in humans and non-human animals alike. <laughs> Mankind's hedonic range, as calibrated simplistically by this toy scale, currently spans minus 10 to plus 10, with approximate hedonic set points clustering slightly above or slightly below hedonic zero. Future civilizations may flourish within a notional hedonic range of, say, plus 90 to plus 100. A twin cubic centimeter-sized hedonic hotspots in the ventral pallidum and the rostral shell of the nucleus accumbens lend themselves to radical enrichment. Reward pathway enhancements can permit a hedonic range that is, is arbitrarily wide or shallow, i.e. characterized by more or less hedonic contrast, yet without ever sinking uh, to malaise-ridden human levels of consciousness. Um, hedonic range sounds a, a cold and clinical phenomenon. Um, let's pause to reflect on what such a range entails. We're alluding to subjectively hypervaluable, uh, a, a subjectively hypervaluable quality of experience that feels more wonderful than you or I have ever felt or could ever feel. Uh, just before uh, an ecstatic epileptic seizure, Prince Mishkin in Dostoevsky's The, the Idiot remarks, quote, I would give my whole life for this one instant, end quote. Biotech can manufacture sentient beings primed for a succession of richer instants than Prince Mishkin's peak experience with an enhanced functionality to match. Uh, naturally, there are genetic parameters other than default tone, whose values will be adjustable by post-genomic bioscience too. Personality traits, a genetic predisposition to empathy or egotism, and a host of cognitive and perceptual capacities and other variables will shortly be amenable to genetic tweaking too. Though to spike some guns, uh, we're talking about genetic predispositions to different character traits and perhaps subsequent epigenetic editing, not a facile and simplistic genetic determinism. Even so, a convergence of scientific evidence confirms the high heritability of our core traits of mood and temperament. Uh, as the reproductive revolution gathers pace, HI predicts there will be intense selection pressure against genes and allelic combinations predisposing to low mood, just as there will be intense selection pressure against, say, the cystic fibrosis allele. Other things being equal, prospective parents want their children to be temperamentally happy. Hippies and tiger mothers alike tend to desire happy and healthy children. Invincible physical and psychological he health is a strategy for winners, both personally and genetically. By contrast, a conditionally activated predisposition to low mood and behavioral suppression is a fallback strategy for life's genetic losers. It's also a recipe for untold misery. Let's run a bit further with this scenario. Um, let's suppose that genetically modulated levels of subjective well-being really are ratcheted upwards globally over time. 
If so, it's just possible that enhanced humanity may at some stage collectively decide enough. After the biology of involuntary suffering has finally been banished, perhaps our descendants will settle for the mediocre, a predisposition to pleasant if still comparatively insipid default states of subjective well-being, yet, yet nothing beyond the normal bounds of contemporary human experience. Maybe such a, such a regime is where we're heading. That's all that abolitionist bioethics entails in the strict sense of the term, an end of involuntary suffering. However, uh, H.I. predicts there will be a long-term selection pressure in favor of information-sensitive gradients of the sublime, a future super-civilization of uh, intelligent super-happiness. Um, how do most people respond to hear this kind of stuff? Um, extreme responses, uh, most memorable but least typical. Um, most common is a vaguely sympathetic but dismissive, uh, not in my lifetime, or indeed for hundreds or perhaps thousands of years. Uh, and this response is uh, understandable. Um, like the suspicion that medical science may find a cure for aging sometime after you're dead, one's feelings about a, pot a, potentially, a potentially glorious future that one will never live to witness are probably likely to be mixed. Chronological bias is endemic to futurist writings. Hard science mingles with wishful thinking. Certainly successful prophets tend to locate salvation or doom within the plausible lifetimes of their audience. Too soon and the prophet risks being confounded, too distant and most folk lose interest. Uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil, 2045, the year humans become immortal, that's in Time Magazine, pitches his dates just right. Um, I'd stress this analysis doesn't mean that uh, Ray's chronology for human super longevity is wrong, just that its convenience should invite especially critical scrutiny. Um, of the uh, enthusiastic uh, responses, my of enthusiastic responses to these kinds of ideas, um, I suppose I have most sympathy with those that say it's obvious we should be using biotechnology to phase out suffering. Uh, how could such a claim be controversial? Uh, however, uh, intuitions of obviousness vary. Some critics find it foot-stampingly obvious that HI is mistaken. Um, what else? Um, if anyone has any, I mean, I'm happy you see to, to go on like this, but I'm also very happy there's going to be a discussion panel. If, there, if anyone has questions or interjections, stop me. Uh, <laughs> okay, fantastic, yeah. Uh, so, do you see a difference between phasing out and suffering, and maybe I missed this, but phasing out suffering and pushing everyone to sort of maximum bliss? And if so, what is the argument that um, people in a state of maximum bliss will bother to sort of continue the existence of humanity or do anything at all? <laughs> two, yeah, two separate questions there. Um, I mean, personally, as a negative utilitarian, I think our overriding ethical obligation is to phase out all forms of, of suffering. Everything is... Everything else is ultimately uh, icing on the cake. However, a combination of the pleasure principle and advanced technology means that I would tentatively predict that we are going to go on uh, uh, ratcheting up uh, our hedonic set points. And I think, yeah, it, it really is quite uh, critical to distinguish between maximum bliss, whether for the individual just being blissed out or theoretically for an entire cosmos in some kind of to the tronium shockwave uh, and aiming for uh, uh, maximum hedonic set points in that, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, even if hedonic set points are uh, ratcheted up, up, upward by an order of magnitude or, or several orders of magnitude, it's still possible in principle to retain critical insight, intellectual responsibility. Would we still be human? I mean, would it, would, would it, uh, would it matter? Um, would, I mean, just, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, just a, uh, okay, this requires a certain effort to the imagination, but imagine you are uh, a post-human superintelligence. If, if humans didn't exist, would you deliberately create a uh, psychotic, brain-damaged, psychopathic, uh, troubled, intellectually feeble-minded, crippled, uh, age? Basically, uh, the very idea would, would, uh, would is vaguely absurd. Would, 
The question is, would post-human superintelligence suffer from status quo bias? Um, I mean, that uh, <laughs> doesn't mean to say that I think uh, uh, post-human superintelligence is going to destroy, destroy humans, but that's because uh, I suspect post-human superintelligence is going to be us, our, our <laughs> biological descendants. Um, but uh, conceptions of post-human superintelligence uh, differ. Some people think organic robots like us are going to edit their own genetic source code and boot out, bootstrap our way uh, to post-human superintelligence with, with the help of AI. Others, like Ray Kurzweil, think essentially we're going to fuse with machines or perhaps digital uploading. Uh, there are other uh, thinkers uh, who, who believe it's, it, it's quite likely there will be some kind of zombie uh, coup, that there will be an intelligence explosion in which uh, uh, AI goes foom, as, as, as it were, uh, and this uh, AGI uh, retires humanity and converts this into paper clips or, or some other optimize, optimizing strategy that we would probably find rather alien. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to just go, yeah, that's, sorry, no, no, no. just please, yes, sir. Um, so, uh, assuming that one wanted to put all their money into uh, furthering your cause of ending suffering, or increasing the hedonic settlement um, within their lifetime, like someone like myself, mm -hmm. where would that money best be um, spent, I suppose, in today's current? Um, in terms of reducing the burden of suffering with a high degree of confidence, uh, I would say something like uh, in vitro meat, which we, we haven't touched on uh, at all, the plight of non-human animals. Um, but yes, the greatest uh, quantity of severe and readily uh, uh, preventable suffering that exists in the world today is, is, uh, is, 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 is factory farming. Uh, and uh, if we assume that moral persuasion alone would take hundred, uh, hundreds of years, um, whereas uh, in vitro meat could, in theory, allow factory farms to be shut and outlawed within a couple of decades, I mean, that's, from an EA perspective, what I would, what it would do. Um, focusing entirely on humans, of course, these technologies are extens uh, uh, can be extended to, to non-humans too, there isn't yet, unfortunately, uh, any charity I know of that campaigns for universal access to pre-implantation genetic screening. Um, uh, but um, yeah, I hope this will. I hope this will change. Um, I've, I mean, I do. <laughs> Never in my life have I, on, uh, it wasn't even intended to do it, never in my life have I ever st stood up and asked, I mean, yes, I, I'm a director of the Neuroethics Foundation. We don't tout for funding or anything like that. If you are seriously wealthy, yes, do, uh, 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 you know, we can discuss, <laughs> yeah, dis discuss things. But no, I said, I, I said, this is, I think, the first time I've ever publicly asked for, for contributions. But uh, anyway, yes, next one. Uh, oh, we were having a Sorry. Yes, please. <laughs> 